Welcome everyone to the May 9th City Council meeting. Welcome to everyone here and at home. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do tonight is um, read a proclamation because it is the 50th year that we've had our Eugene Symphony, and I think it's of such importance to our community that I wanted to do this. So, um, whereas music is a universal language by which we can all learn and experience together, building bridges between differences and connecting us as one humanity, and whereas the mission of Eugene Symphony is enriching lives through the power of music, and in this 50th year, it has done so for 25,000 adults and youth during its concerts at the Holt Center for the Performing Arts and throughout the Willamette Valley. And whereas Eugene Symphony is nationally recognized as a model for regional orchestras for its rich history of selecting talented conductors and for its education and community engagement programs, which today touch the lives of more than 20,000 Oregonians annually, and whereas Eugene Symphony employs more than 80 professional musicians, many of whom make their lives in Eugene and contribute to our rich cultural landscape, and whereas for 50 years Eugene Symphony has been led and nurtured by passionate volunteers who help create the orchestral organization we enjoy today, and whereas patrons of Eugene Symphony support our local businesses and the livelihood of downtown when they attend concerts, contributing to a strong ecosystem for our city's cultural and economic growth, and whereas the people of Eugene will continue to support the work of Eugene Symphony so that its success continues for generations to come. Now, therefore, I, Kitty Piercy, Mayor of the City of Eugene, Oregon, do hereby proclaim May 12, 2016 to be Eugene Symphony Day and encourage the community to join together in recognition of the finale of the symphony's 50th anniversary season. Congratulations to them. Out of them. So first up here is the public forum. The public forum is an opportunity for individuals to speak to the city council on any city related issues except for those items which have already been heard by a hearings official or are on tonight's agenda as a public hearing. Each person will have three minutes to speak when you come to the podium. Please give your name, city of residence, and for Eugene residence, your ward if known. The timer and lights indicate the time you have to speak. The red light indicates the end of three minutes. I think you heard Councillor Clark's voice down there. I don't know if any of the others are on right now. I think both of them. So Councillor Poling, count is Councillor Zelenka. Anyway. Yes. yes so. Thank you, Mayor. I'm on the phone. <laughs> Councillor Zelenka. Thank you. All right. So first up tonight for the public hearing is Ed Moya, followed by Susan Ban. Good evening. My name is Ed Moy, and I live and pay taxes in Betty Taylor's ward. Um, I was, I've worked for the last couple of weeks on something to come in here and say, and the events over the last few weeks have made me decide that a lot of it I'm just going to skip over. Um, clear communication and trust between citizens in their city is the bedrock of modern democracy. Unfortunately, Swazi has seriously damaged this critical matrix. Over the past eight months um, that I fought against Swazi, I must have looked and sounded hostile. But I'm sure you would all feel the same way if your homes were so threatened. I'm going to skip the big section. Now, after eight months of public outcry, planners admit that Swazi was horribly flawed. They continue, don't worry, we'll try harder this time. We'll invite everybody to come participate. You can trust us because we've done this before. But my point of view is that this all comers approach will only inflame the situation. I fear that this will just bring in people from all over the country to come tell the neighbors they have to accept son of Swazi. We have already wasted a million dollars and endured eight difficult months of approving that approach will not work. Would you trust somebody who had just attempted to rob you because they said sorry when they got caught? On the positive side, these last eight months have focused the neighborhood into a groundswell of community involvement. Therein lies the path from lemons to lemonade. The Clark Brown motion implements a neighborhood refinement plan the affected neighbors can live with. 
It has been unanimously endorsed by the South Willamette Neighbors Organization. It reduces the scope of the plan. It ensures there will be no secret deals made. It fulfills the ideal that over 600 people have petitioned the city to instigate. It focuses on the people who live in the plan area, not speculators and developers who are in it for the money, or unaffected NIMBYs who want to make sure it happens in somebody else's neighborhood, not their own. Trust is earned by actions, not words. The council now has a choice. They can force resistant neighborhoods into a future plotted for and by NIMBY, speculators, and bureaucrats. Or they can empower the people who have invested their lives in building that neighborhood. The Clark Brown motion is the clearest path to ending this fight and facing the future. It's time for the planning department to declare victory, step back, and listen to the neighbors. Up next is Susan Band, followed by Karen Crichton. Good evening, my name is Susan Ban. I live in Ward 4. Thank you, Mayor and City Councilors, for this opportunity. I'm here tonight to support the resolution in support of Housing First that's put forward by the Human Rights Commission. As Executive Director at Shelter Care, I am familiar with the challenges and opportunities the Housing First model offers a community like ours. In 2006, our Housing First program began as a pilot with only six units. In the decades since, we have grown the number of units using an array of funding streams, including state and federal dollars. Today, we operate approximately 200 units across the metropolitan area. Individuals who have lived on the streets for years and for decades are moved off the street and into private apartment units where they are provided an array of support services to promote their success. In some cases, shelter care holds the lease with the landlord. That allows us to serve people who have significant barriers, poor rental history, poor credit history, active substance use, or no personal identification. We use a harm reduction model related to substance abuse. That means we start with people where they are. Uh, addiction is not a barrier to housing. In 2010, we asked a master's level volunteer to do a chart review of all the clients during the first four, year of, first four years of the Housing First program. The results were significant. During participation in the Housing First program, participants incurred 87% fewer medical hospitalizations, 82% fewer psychiatric hospitalizations. In addition, when there were hospitalizations of program participants, the length of stay was significantly reduced, 71% lower for any hospitalization lasting more than five days, 84% drop in hospitalization lasting two to five days. So you I should have a handout that I handed out earlier because our study focused mostly on hospitalization and associated costs. The National Alliance to End Homelessness has data from other national studies that was distributed just a minute ago, and that include the cost of incarceration. So in the Portland, Oregon research study that was done in 2006, an investment of $10,000 per person in housing saved the city in all of those other costs about $25,000. So there's clearly a cost benefit. As a community, we really need many different strategies and tactics to address the social problems of poverty and homelessness. What I suggest is that Housing First is one strategy that is affordable. It has research replicated positive results, and it can be done without any major infrastructure or development at, ex at an exceptional cost. So that's my point. Thank you. Thank you. Karen Crichton is next, followed by Seth Sadowski. Hello, my name is Karen Creighton. I live in Eugene in Councilor Clark's ward, and I am also a City of Eugene employee. I've been a temporary employee for 26 years, working uh, very part-time as a fitness instructor while I also worked in human services and nursing and teaching, and for the last four years, nearly part-time at the Sheldon Community Center. So I'm here tonight because I have a question for the counselors and and uh, and Manager Ruiz that I can't take to my supervisors. Being a City of Eugene employee, we practice ethical communication, so I'm coming directly to the folks who I'm hoping can answer this question. I have uh, a copy of three pieces of paper, and um, the first one I don't have any questions of. This is a 
copy of a letter from the city manager's office and the subject is nomination for employee recognition award. So uh, I want to thank uh, Kitty Percy and John Ruiz and uh, other people who nominated Sheldon employees for being exemplary employees. Uh, the sentence that is particularly uh, pleasant to read is our organization has a reputation for being the first and the best at many things. Your work, referring to Sheldon staff, went a step higher than that. So I don't have any questions on this. Um, Sheldon Community Center is an amazing place. It truly is community. We get children when they're in diapers and they stay with us until they're ready to go to middle school. We also get the children who have special needs and can't find other care. Uh, we have staff, 80% of us are temporary employees who've been there for anywhere from six to 15 years. We work on a very lean uh, budget. Most of us make between 10 and $12 an hour with no benefits, but we still come because we love the job. Um, our saying is we're improving the world one child at a time. Children uh, love the school. They run up the ramp to come to school. They love the teachers. They love the program. They build friends. So it's truly a community center, and I have no questions on that part, and thank you again for the letter. Uh, the next thing I do have some questions about, which I don't expect you all to answer, but last week we got a memo that the summer camps have been significantly reduced in staffing as a result of budget shortfalls. The summer camp in particular for the uh, elementary school age children will be cut in half. So I'm not sure how we make a decision of whether we cut the children's spots that we've had since they were infants or if we cut the special ed uh, children from our program, but that's concerning to me. Um, but my question to the council is uh, the $7 million, and I did a little math crunching, and that could make 2,000 jobs and serve 12 to 14,000 children. So my question is, as stewards of taxpayer dollars, are we building buildings or community? Next up is Seth Sadowski, followed by Corina McWilliams. Hi, my name is Seth Sadowski. I'm a Ward 2 homeowner. I chair the city's Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee. I serve on the board of Southeast Neighbors, and I'm a member of the Walkable Eugene Citizens Advisory Network. I was very dismayed when the South Willamette Special Area Zone process came to a crashing halt last fall. I'd like to remind you that the last council action on this subject was a resolution calling for a facilitated process to work through some of the disagreements so that we can move forward on this. This process has not yet occurred. The plan currently being floated by Councilors Brown and Clark will significantly narrow the scope of planning on South Willamette. Looking at the map included with a proposal makes me wonder why we would bother planning that area at all as most of it is already full with commercial and it doesn't go off of Willamette Street more than half a block in most cases. In addition to geographic limitation, this plan will overly privilege a small group of current homeowners who, in addition to expressing opposition to change, are relatively affluent, not particularly diverse, and relatively old compared to the population at large, rather than a cross-section of our community. As proposed, this would not be any kind of an open process. The current controversy in housing has been handled has not just affected the trust between the city staff and the couple dozen loudest and angriest neighbors. It has also shown the hundreds or perhaps thousands, I don't know exactly how many, of people who participated in various stages of the invention Eugene process that this council will allow a few angry, well-connected, upper-middle-class residents to kill a process that's been five years in the making. As Councillor Evans said on November 9th, this is important and we need to get it right. That means an inclusive process that welcomes everyone and clearly states the necessary goals that need to be accomplished by any rezoning or planning process. Details aside, the most convenient neighborhoods in our city need to be amenable to accommodating growth so that we can get around without private cars all the time and reduce our fossil fuel reliance. That's the type of future for Eugene that I would like to envision. Karina McWilliams is next, followed by Thomas Price. 
Good evening, City Council. My name is Karina McWilliams, and I'm here to talk about the Climate Recovery Ordinance. With elections coming up, we're really excited to see that climate action is a main priority for many city government candidates. Climate change is not only extremely important to the citizens of Eugene, but also to people all over the world, of all ages and walks of life. In 2014, the adoption of the CRO was considered progressive, and it was. However, the science-based science legislation in the ordinance is rapidly approaching a point of obsolescence. The longer we wait to begin enforcing the CRO, the closer we get to a point where any implementation will be ineffective. The principles and deadlines written in the CRO were not guidelines, they were ultimatums. If we don't take the necessary steps now towards a clean energy economy, our future, our future generations will be forced to cope with the innumerable threats that climate change presents. Thank you for everything that you've done so far concerning the CRO, and please keep working in the direction of a healthy atmosphere and a safe future. Thomas Price is next, followed by Jennifer Smith. <coughs> Good evening, Councilors, Mayor, and City Manager. My name is Thomas Price. I am from Ward 8. I am not here as one of your Sustainability Commissioners. I am not here because I was part of Envision Eugene. I'm here as a individual who is looking for a balanced approach, social equity, and priorities that are in alignment Part of the reason I'm not here as a sustainability commissioner is because unless you are asking the questions, you're not ready for the answers. And so far, you haven't been asking the questions of your sustainability commission. These processes are not a process of social equity. Currently, we have processes that are influenced either by money, which we all need, we need the economic development, or they're being basically shanghaied by people who are taking their limited resources and fighting and seeing who can holler the loudest. We have a process, we actually have several processes that are getting circumvented. Your sustainability commission sat and did not meet one month because of all this. We spoke to you and basically were berated in the newspaper. We're not getting asked to be part of the process, even though you guys voted us into action. As your citizen who moved here in 97 has worked with many of your processes and problems from the <clears throat> toxic right to no law and many other neighborhood services issues. We have processes. We have a city manager who actually should be the main one we're looking to to help sort out. Right now his staff is getting hit hard and I care about my neighbors and some of your staff is my neighbors, are my neighbors. I believe we need to change the conversation I am looking for leadership. I am not looking for the Clark Brown plan. To me, that means you guys are not working as cohesive leaders. That means you're divided. That means there's small groups pulling your strings and you are not speaking for the sustainability of a healthy Eugene. I could talk to you about the special limit area zone, I know that there were some problems. It was actually a draft. It was a draft that may not have gotten implemented real well. Thank you. Jennifer Smith is next, followed by Vic Harriton. Good evening. My name is Jennifer Smith and I own a home in Ward 2. I'm here to voice my desire for community planning that is inclusive and is based in mutual trust. I understand there's fear about neighborhood change, and I would like others to understand my fear about a community that doesn't adjust to reality. I love Eugene's emerging reality, one where our community embraces a population that is increasingly diverse in ages, incomes, experiences, color, language, and family composition. 
I love our reality of recognizing the value of our fertile and natural surrounding lands and the beautiful park spaces within our growth boundary. A reality where we say yes to transportation options and thoughtfully concentrate our gold standard rapid bus lines along denser corridors with thriving commercial activity. I want my child to enjoy the reality I see unfolding before us. He deserves it. Those who haven't moved here yet deserve it. And those who are traditionally shut out of decision making deserve it. And that brings me to the question of who should be planning our community? Should we all be heard? Yes, we should all be represented in a planning process. Traditionally, neighborhood associations have come together to protect against change, and I see a role for them. But too often, they don't represent my interests or the reality my, children will, my child will live in 20 or 30 years from now. Responsible leadership is about making the hard decisions now. I don't want to see low-income and middle-income people squeezed out of Eugene because we have foreseen yet failed to provide housing options that meet their needs. And as a low-income person saddled with student <coughs> debt, their needs are my needs also. I want to meet other people who have a vision beyond unaffordable sprawl and protectionism. And I want to hear and honor those who have fears about the emerging Eugene I've described. I plan on living and working in Eugene for many decades to come, and I look forward to building our future together. I hope to see you all on June 20th at the Mayor's Forum. Thank you for listening. Carrington is next, followed by Sage Fox. Hello, this is, I'm Vic Harriton. I'm currently the uh, chair of Sheena, co-chair of the Council of South Eugene Neighborhoods. I'm not here uh, for either one of those. I'm here as an individual. Um, I wanted to thank Mayor Piercy, uh, City Manager uh, Ruiz, or Ruiz? I've heard it both ways, <laughs> so sorry. Um, for the recommendation that we stop what's currently the Swazi. I think that's a really good start to getting the trust back. Um, I've heard some others here before about realities, and uh, realities can be skewed. You have an island of a urban growth boundary. You have an island, your property values are gonna go up. You just, it's just, I've seen it everywhere I've lived, from New York to, Arizona, Texas, Colorado, I'm going to see it here if I live this long, but it will happen here. Um, so <coughs> resolving that's going to be difficult. Um, I encourage you all to vote in favor of stopping the Swazi tonight. I believe that's tonight, at least I saw on the agenda. Um, and I am so very pleased that my neighbors, and I've had some issues, but my neighbors are wholly supporting the Clark Brown Initiative. The, um, and in keeping it into a smaller area, into the commercial area, and it's the, this small group is like 600 people in South Willamette neighbors who have signed. You have maybe a dozen people in We Can or whatever they want to call themselves who are trying to change the process now again. So they don't live in the area. A couple of them are just landowners, which they have a right to have a voice, but they don't have the right to dictate everything. They don't live there. They live on one of those like 300 acres. Um, what I'd like to encourage you to do is tonight, let's remove this, let's get the trust back, let's get a win for the city. You get a lot of these rezonings you want to do. So let's start off right. Let's start small, get a win in the commercial area. Let's do it right. Maybe that bowling alley can have multiple levels on it so you can have apartments, not one level for commercial. There shouldn't be anything built for just one level anymore. But we don't need it to have to be eight levels either, or six levels. You know, it, it really needs to be something that's 
good for the folks who are living in the area. And I would encourage you to listen to the folks who live in the area. Thank you. Thank you. Sage Fox is next, followed by Jenny Gordon. Good evening, I'm Sage Fox, and I'm here again to discuss the Climate Recovery Ordinance. I understand that you're starting to get the ball rolling again on implementation, and I really appreciate your efforts. Furthermore, I want to thank you for planning meetings to discuss the carbon budget in, I believe, May and June. Um, once again, I strongly urge you to move forward as hastily as possible as Time is a very critical part of the recovery plan. Um, specifically, I suggest that you start by working on uh, bike transportation infrastructure um, in the near future since it's getting warm outside. People are starting to bike and uh, poorly planned bike routes and lack of connection between uh, bike paths are stopping some people from biking because it's simply unsafe. Thank you very much for your consideration. I hope you continue to move forward with this. Jenny Gordon is next, followed by Lori Powell. Good evening. I am Jenny Gordon and live in Ward 3. I'm a psychologist in private practice for 20 years and a member of 350 Eugene. The first, as you determine how to allocate city funding that is consistent with the needs and expressed desires of Eugenians, I'd like to offer two stories. The first story is in honor of my sister, Sharon Gordon. Today marks her 65th birthday. It would mark her 65th birthday. However, at 51, she was diagnosed with stage four cancer, which took her life 10 months later. It is in her spirit of advocacy. She was a local attorney, a musician in the Eugene Symphony, and she taught young people music that I am moved to engage in civic life and to believe that what I share with you can and will make a difference. So by the time a diagnosis of her illness was made, the disease had progressed into her bones and other vital organs. As you might imagine, the sense of urgency within our family was intense as we searched for anything that might put this disease into remission. And the tension between hope and hopelessness was lived out every single day. In one of our last phone conversations, Sharon alluded to her own denial of listening to her body. And it is this point that I wish to underscore, how when faced with life-threatening situations, one of our very human responses is to deny that the problem is happening and that the symptoms are real. It is extremely courageous to look squarely at the situation we are facing with respect to climate change and the prospect of human extinction. So this brings me to my second story. In 1990, I had the good fortune of visiting Cape Town, South Africa. One day, I was visiting a nearby township of dwellings made of cardboard and tin scraps, dirt, yet, dirt roads yet clean. The people were celebrating the opening of their first building, a church, and that boasted running water, solid walls, and a secure rooftop. I was walking with a priest from Namibia who was there to join in the festivities, and as the full moon rose over the eastern hills, he said to me, if you want to be a leader, you must be like the moon is to the sun and reflect the light of the people. I am here tonight to appeal to you, our leaders and city manager, to be like the moon is to the sun and reflect the light of the people you serve as you consider the city's budget this Wednesday. Please put our money and our resources toward climate restoration. Even as the situation appears hopeless, please give us reason to hope. Thank you. Lori Powell is next, followed by Emily Semple. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Lori Powell. <clears throat> I live in Ward 1, and I'm a member of 350 Eugene, and I'm here tonight concerning the Climate Recovery Ordinance, or CRO. 
On behalf of 350 Eugene and our Children's Trust, we thank the Council and the City Manager's Office uh, for reaching out to us these past few weeks to schedule a time to meet to discuss the CRO. And we appreciate that many of you are working behind the scenes to try and move the CRO forward. Similarly, our Children's Trust is working behind the scenes on its 50 state-based cases and federal court case, all based on the public trust doctrine that children have a constitutional right to a healthy climate. In a much more public event, members from our city, from our chapter of 350 Eugene, uh, people from around the state and the region are today and in the next few days heading to the city of Anacortes, Washington, to join um, what we hope to be a couple of thousand people who will engage in peaceful acts of civil disobedience outside the Shell to Soro oil refineries. This event is called Break Free. Pacific Northwest. What knits all these efforts together is the common knowledge that tackling the climate crisis is an all-hands-on-deck galvanizing effort with each stakeholder group, and we are all stakeholders in this, taking on the pieces that we all can with as much integrity and dedication as possible. So we look forward to not just one, but ongoing meetings with the city manager's office to support the timely forward movement of the CRO. We also look forward to the upcoming meetings concerning the 350 carbon budget on May 18th and June 13th, respectively. And finally, thank you all for your service. Good night. Emily Simple is next, followed by Merle Wiener. Hello, I'm Emily Semple. I live in Ward 1. I thank you so much for all of the work on helping the homeless. We're still in a very critical situation. I applaud and support Housing First. The problem is we don't have enough houses, so I would really like us to move even farther to Shelter First. We have a lot of prototypes that are working, Let's get some more of them, please. Even a tent, a few small places to camp. I still see people sleeping on the sidewalk downtown. It's really disturbing. So while we're talking about a $24, $25 million city hall, $7 million to quiet the trains, up to $25 million for Saturday market improvements, $7 million for um, a farmer's market, and fiber optics. Some of these, I think, are really, really valuable. But please, put in the budget shelter first. We need places that can happen right now for sleeping, but we need a true city shelter. We have hearts. Let's live there. Thank you. Merle Wiener is next, followed by Richard Gusky. Hi, my name is Merle Weiner. I own a home in Ward 1, and I also own property in the South Willamette Special Area Zone in Ward 2. One day, I hope to live in a condo on my property. I urge you to vote against the Brown-Clark proposal. The proposal empowers neighborhood associations and CSEN, two bodies that are unrepresentative and undemocratic. The proposal does this through its principle one and by requiring that the council select planning team members from those nominated by neighborhood associations. Let me tell you about my neighborhood association and CSEN. I started attending neighborhood association meetings and CSEN meetings when CSEN helped derail five years of city planning that reflected the time and energy of hundreds of people. These insular groups lack racial, age, and income diversity. Notably absent are those who are younger, lower income, and renters. Moreover, my neighborhood association, Sheena, has purposefully excluded people with different views. It has held secret meetings over email in violation of the Neighborhood Association bylaws, the Council's Neighborhood Organization Recognition Policy, and Oregon's public meeting laws. It has rigged committees and processes to exclude those with different views. 
This neighborhood association undermines public participation. My experience with CSEN is similar. CSEN concentrates the worst aspects of the neighborhood associations into one organization. CSEN has held some board meetings at private residences and recently limited membership on its South Willamette subcommittee to those appointed by the neighborhood associations. Its principles of participation and charter allow removal of subcommittee members if they speak out publicly against the subcommittee's actions or dissent from its predetermined direction. The Brown-Clark proposal empowers these groups and shuts out neighbors like me who have different points of view. As Oregon Consensus found, distrust and disagreement exist between residents. The issues are of deep concern to everyone involved, but this proposal will exacerbate the distrust and disagreement. Thank you. Richard Gusky is next, followed by Lonnie Douglas. Well, it's been a long time since I've been here. <laughs> 25 years. I um, you want to introduce yourself, Richard? Or, oh, my name is Richard Gusky. I live in Claire's ward, and that is Whitaker. And I'm a retired uh, specialist in fair housing, and my point of view regarding housing tends to be seen through the lens of rights rather than uh, requests. I appreciate um, Susan Band's presentation on Housing First. Uh, not only has she done a, a terrific job in making it happen, it's been really her life's work, and I appreciate that greatly. In order to make the kinds of connections we need to make between the situation on the ground, as it were, of what I consider to be a primary <coughs> population, which is mentally ill, disabled, homeless persons, we need to have a step that will cover the interests and caring for of that population until we have the resources that Housing First is holding in front of us, and that's not going to happen soon. Recently, we housed in excess of 400 veterans in a very rapid housing project that got uh, great uh, attention and possibly sucked up 400 living spaces in the county, which may be all we have. We need a, re we need a shelter. Shelters are being built um, and put together in Beaverton, in Bend, um, in Santa Clara County, California, which is one of the first Housing First projects. They are considered a, a regular part of the Housing First strategy. They're um, putting together such projects in Boulder, Colorado. I think that we need to make certain that the issue of a shelter be given an important emphasis as we move toward Housing First, because we're going to have to have a place to put people. And it may be that persons who are mentally ill and disabled and, house and homeless, as defined by the HUD's um, chronically homeless definition, have a fair housing right to housing, and that the process is exposed to the concept of disparate impact, meaning that our policies are actually bringing harm to a population that is protected. Thank you. Thank you. Lonnie Douglas is next followed by Jack Richardson. Hello, my name is Lonnie Douglas. I'm a uh, board member with the Eugene Springfield Solidarity Network. First, I'd like to thank Councilman Brown for his recent op-ed in the Register Guard, exposing the obscene waste and abuse of our city manager, uh, Mr. John Reese. The city of Eugene refuses to spend any serious money to solve our unhoused crisis, yet we allow the city manager, Mr. Reese, to make backroom deals with developers that cost the city millions of taxpayer dollars. The city of Eugene 
continues to exploit and abuse city workers by falsely labeling them as temporary, even though many of them have worked for the city uh, for years and refuses to pay them a fair living wage and give them decent hours. Yet Mr. Ruiz makes changes to approve plans for a new city hall that will cost taxpayers an unforeseen and unapproved $7 million without consulting or notifying anyone. The city of Eugene has allowed Mr. Ruiz to cut employee services and benefit that benefits families and elderly, yet the city council gives him a free pass when he blows $7 million of taxpayer money. The plans for the City Hall have been approved, the cost was set, yet Ms. Ruiz privately instructed the architects and the construction manager to add design elements that, in his opinion, more fully reflected the Council's values. So I can't help and wonder, but wonder what each of you value. Ms. Ruiz seems to think he knows. Ms. Ruiz seems to think that what you our city council value isn't children or seniors or working families. He doesn't seem to think you value fiscal responsibility or transparency. No, Mr. Reese, Reese seems to think that you value a pretty building with lots of bells and whistles. I understand that the city council rejected by a three to five vote a motion to hold at least one more work session to examine the only just provided financial information for this now $25 million project for more detail. Um, I would say uh, Councilman Brown included, uh, concluded in his op-ed uh, by calling for the City Council to suspend this deeply flawed City Hall process, pay off any remaining bills, and begin to examine other more rational, cost-effective solutions. And the members of the Eugene Springfield Solidarity Network strongly agree. Lastly, what I would say is uh, I worked in the, was in the military for 25 years and dealt with a lot of government contracts. And if I had told somebody to stop or start work or change a contract without having it approved, and it cost the federal government $7 million, I would have been standing in front of a court-martial, and then I would have been breaking rocks in a military brig. Um, anyway, Jack, thank you very much. Jack Richardson is next, followed by Jennifer Frenzer Knowlton. Hi, I'm Jack Richardson. Uh, I am a rural Lane County resident. I am up the Mackenzie. Uh, I'm here to speak to you about the Lane County Farmers Market, though. Um, I first wanted to express my sincere appreciation for the generous $500,000 um, that the city has bestowed upon the Lane County Farmers Market. Your continued support, support of our market has been greatly appreciated. We have intentions of using these funds in improving our site. I'm taking the mic, but I wanted to point out that there are several other farmers and staff members from our Lane County Farm Farmers Market over my left shoulder here. They're showing their support as well. I have grown up in this area, and I have very fond memories of visiting the farmers market. As a kid, I remember thinking that I wanted to be a farmer and sell my food at this market one day. Thinking that I wanted to do this, I pursued it, and 10 years ago I started, and today I'm still vending down, these, uh, down here at these park blocks just across the way. I hope to continue to do so, and I hope more farmers can have the opportunity as well. The farmer's market is an incredibly important venue for us, not only to sell our products, but also connect with the local buying community. It is, af it is as if we are able to have a little storefront right here in downtown. And being farmers in rural Lane County, I can't imagine any better way to connect with the Eugene food buying community. As several of our board members, staff, and uh, supporters of the market have done on other occasions. I have wanted. I also wanted to take a minute to remind folks of the needs of our dear little market. We have an increasing demand for local food in this town. We have a growing number of producers of these items as well. This and a general increase in downtown foot traffic have really been showing itself at the market this spring, and we've been noticing an increase in demand for the market and the limitations of the current site as it sits. We have unanimous support from our vendors for maintaining the market in its current location. And it's hard to get unanimous support for anything from a group of fiercely independent farmers and artisans. As our site is currently being utilized, we have very poor flow for the foot traffic and a varying quality of vending spaces. That creates 
very good spots for established farmers and very poor spots for newcomers. With the space to lay out the market differently, we could start to set up our market in a way that would reflect the high quality of produce and goods that are being displayed. As it stands now, we have incredible, incredible vendors, but a dismal setup. Please continue to keep the market in its current site, and let's improve that site and add an interior and exterior or indoor or outdoor uh, space for the local growers and the dedicated farmers market community that comes out to every market already, rain or shine. Thank you. Jennifer Frenzer Nolten is next, followed by Sue Saralupe. Jennifer Frenzer Nolten, and I'm in um, Betty Taylor's ward. So um, I'm here to speak this evening on the Housing First Resolution. Um, I also wanted to echo some of the comments made previously um, about the budget and the need for addressing the shelter crisis that we have. We do need a shelter. We need people off the street while we wait for permanent housing. That's got to be part of the strategy. Also, I would like us to have a 24-hour, um, seven-day-a-week cahoots-type responder and outreach. That's got to be part of taking care of people who um, need services and relieve law enforcement from that type of intervention, having people who are specifically trained in doing that outreach. So as terms, in terms of the Housing First resolution, um, we would, uh, the work group would like to propose two revisions. Um, there is some history to these drafts that we've been working on. Uh, <laughs> Great. I'm in a loop. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to wrap, though. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> There's been several revisions made, but two stand out. Um, in section one, the second sentence, the, word, the phrase, the primary strategy, we would like to have that revised to a core strategy. As Susan Bann pointed out, there are several low-cost housing strategies that are effective. Housing First is one of them. It makes sense to take that qualifying language out since this is a, a document that will guide priorities and budgeting. So um, we request that it's revised to a core strategy in that section one first sent second sentence. Excuse in section two, the last sentence, we're asking for the current programs to be um, amended to read the current programs and future program expansions and innovations. There just needs to be more work done on how to address the short-term issue of shelter and crisis of that right now. And currently, um, we're just not touching how big the problem is. We've got some uh, programs that have had good trial pilot re you know, records, but they need to be expanded. And cities all over the country are coming up with innovations that we need to try. Portland's trying some things we haven't tried yet. Um, so I'd like to keep the future um, expansions and innovations in that language there. Originally, this draft has come a long way from the original, which emphasized long-term and diverting. Thank you. Sue Serlupe is next, followed by Michael Gannon. I'm Sue Sierra Lupe, and I live Talk in right Ward into it. 1. You, you got yeah, bring it close to you. Do I have it there? Yeah. Can you hear me now? If you speak at that, yeah. Oh, I have That's to speak good. louder. Yeah. Okay. I do practice speaking loudly at home, but I can do that here, too. Um, my name is Sue Sierra Lupe, and I'm in Ward 1, and I'm also the clinic manager at Occupy Medical, and I heard tonight that you were talking about adding more bathrooms downtown, and I feel it is my job right now to reiterate the importance of that. I really applaud you taking that seriously. Um, I understand that there is some concern about having the bathrooms monitored, but in my personal experience, as the wife of a contract, um, a construction worker, that if you want to 
mitigate the amount of wear and tear in a bathroom, what you do is add another bathroom. So you would actually save money if you just had more bathrooms rather than having a paid attendant. Not that I'm against adding jobs, but in reality, you just have more bathrooms and then fewer people frequent those bathrooms. And we really do need the bathrooms for hygiene, for safety. I'm talking to the people in Corvallis right now about concerns about tuberculosis, I'm sorry, tuberculosis and some of the other diseases that we're seeing going through Lane County. And really the best way of handling that other than vaccines is through hygiene. So I applaud you in working on these bathrooms. The more the better um, and, and the more access to um, hot and cold running water and flushing toilets, the better. You will, you will truly save money just by spending a little money on more bathrooms. Thank you. Michael Gannon is next, followed by Eliza Kuszynski. Uh, good evening. I'm Michael Gannon. And I live in Eugene. I've lived here about 50 years. I, um, I came back to Eugene after a sort of a strange struggle with the 60s where I, as a youth, saw so many things turned upside down by the war in Vietnam. I went to Los Angeles because I thought I could be more effective. And one of my pleasant memories of Los Angeles is the opportunity to watch a whole bunch of cars cruising down one of their large boulevards stop because I stood at the curb and was preparing to find a safe spot to cross. They were actually obeying a California state law. <clears throat> so you can imagine what it might be like for a young hippie in Los Angeles in 1970 to be in front of amazing automobiles, chauffeured limos, with car phones, etc. Sweep like this and stop for me because I was a human with a beating heart and the state legislature in Sacramento said stop for this guy when he gets to an intersection. Now some people refer to me as an old hippie I came back to Eugene thinking that Los Angeles was obviously not the spot for really progressive input into how our society lives. But now I see that uh, cars don't stop for me at intersections, even though the Oregon legislature recently address the problem by making crosswalks sort of sanctuaries and that drivers were supposed to stop. For the $67,000 that you use to keep homeless people out from under bridges, you could afford a very small public education process to teach people in Eugene to respect pedestrians and also honor our climate recovery ordinance by stopping the amount of gasoline burned in Eugene. Thank you. Thanks. Eliza Kaczynski is next, followed by Judy Horseman. Thank you. 
My name is Eliza Kaczynski. I'm a Ward 1 resident. I'm a member of WECAN, the Walkable Eugene Citizens Advisory Network. WECAN sent a letter to Council on Thursday, May 5th, discussing our concerns with the Clark Brown proposal for how to move forward with the South Willamette process. I both lived and worked on South Willamette Street while the South Willamette Code was being produced. I participated in the original process and ultimately, while I did not agree with everything, felt that the end product balanced my opinions with the other opinions I heard expressed, as well as broader citywide goals dealing with climate recovery and housing affordability. I know that not everyone had that opportunity to participate or feels the way that I do, but I don't feel that the way to address that problem is to throw aside all of the work that was done and restart with a process that also puts limits on participation and in particular excludes those residents and citizens who are not well represented by neighborhood associations, such as renters, younger residents, and those who are already struggling to find affordable housing in Eugene. While I've since moved to the Jefferson Westside neighborhood, in part because there weren't hard housing options for me in South Willamette, I have not stopped caring about the South Willamette neighborhood and how the outcome of this process affects both the, that neighborhood and all of Eugene. We all understand the techniques and tools that we work out here will influence what happens in my neighborhood and in other neighborhoods throughout Eugene. All neighborhoods in Eugene need to do their part to help to make sure that we have enough housing so that we can meet the additional demand that is coming and maintain and improve housing affordability and choice in the process. To create a truly community supported plan, we need to engage the whole community, not just those who are active members of neighborhood associations. We need to make sure that we have processes in place that provide a chance for all affected citizens to provide input and develop methods to balance that input to create a plan that can be widely supported. The current controversy and how it has been handled has not just affected trust between city staff and neighbors, but it has damaged trust between everybody, residents and council, citizens and neighborhood associations, and between neighbors with different views and perspectives and needs. The Clark Brown proposal does not address this, and attempting to initiate such a process prior to resolving these issues will make things worse, not better. I urge Council to fulfill the terms of the motion of November 9th and complete and consider the outcome of the facilitated discussion prior to determining how to move forward and to help us as a community rebuild the trust that has been lost. Thank you. Judy Horseman is next, followed by Howie Wynette. My name is Judy Horseman. I live at 1835 East 28th, and that's Councilman Zelenka's ward. I think the current South Willamette Special Area Zone Plan does not adequately engage the neighbors, does not meet their needs, and could potentially destroy their neighborhood. I think they have to, sorry, I think we have to find ways to protect existing neighborhoods while enabling citywide discussion about how to solve the overarching needs of our community. I support the Oregon Consensus Assessment Report that we need to craft a, pr a process that builds trust, improves communication, and develops better understanding between the city and its citizens. However, I am very concerned about the Clark Brown proposal is not that process because it does not include input from community members outside the four specified neighborhoods. I have shopped along South Willamette Street for decades. But although I live close by, I don't live in one of those neighborhoods. I want a plan that protects the neighborhood and serves the community. South Willamette, like it or not, is a regional commercial center and should be recognized as such. It doesn't belong to just the neighbors adjacent to it. I am concerned that refinement plans generated by individual neighborhoods without input from other community stakeholders are likely to be somewhat isolationist and may set a bad precedent as a template for increasing density in other parts of town and for working successfully to find solutions for housing and transportation choices and dealing with climate change. 
I applaud Mary, Mayor Piercy for initiating a forum. I hope we can find a process that includes community-wide input in a way that satisfies the needs of both the Willamette, so, sorry, South Willamette neighbors as well as the larger community. Thank you. Howie Bonnet next, followed by Cindy Kokus. Thank you, Mayor. Everything I was going to say has been said. Okay. Here's to you, Howie. <laughs> <laughs> Cindy. And then Kim Kimberly Glayton. Good evening. I'm Cindy Kokus and I have moved. So now I am with um, Betty Taylor. And tonight I speak for Church and United of Lane County. Several decades ago, we initiated the faith community opening their churches to shelter families. And we were told at the time that this was a temporary process while the county and the government created affordable housing. Not. Our experience is that we have had anti-tax, pro-corporate decisions and in the last 10 years, we've seen profits go up 170%, wealth go up 25%. In the last 10 years, this isn't something I've invented. It's something that studies are done by various groups that are concerned about justice beyond profit. And this burden has been shifted to the least able. We see low wages and high rents child care that's way beyond the means of most of the working class people. We are confronted with a United Way report that says 150,000 people are on the verge of becoming homeless in Lane County. And this has the tricky little title of the ALICE report. It's an acronym for Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed translate the working poor. On April 6, a letter was in the Register Guard saying, the apathy towards homelessness is baffling. And Church Women United agrees. It was declared to be a state of emergency. We can't tell what's being done. What about safety, shelter, and sanitation? What's happening? Who's doing something? We're a bunch of old ladies, and we've been around a long time, and we know when there's some kind of lateral pass and pat on the head. February 22nd, I put in a comment. I went to five city councilmen, the mayor and the city manager. I received a reply from the mayor listing manner of things that we had done. But we're talking inadequate. If we've got 100,000 people ready to become homeless, 100 things here and 10 things there are kind of irrelevant. It came into our hands at, City, at Church Women United a paper called Unintended Consequences by a very credible person who does a lot of work, hard work. We have Franciscans on the street watching criminalization of people. Believe me, it's not credible what's going on. Kimberly Gladen is next, followed by Spencer Nelson. Hi, I'm Kimberly Gladen, and I live downtown. Um, I'm really glad you're um, listening in, Mike, because uh, you inspired me to come down. Um, what I want to talk about is unequal application of the laws and ordinances in this city in regards to um, the Courthouse Plaza crew on Saturdays. Um, farmer's Market, Saturday Market, um, any other event, for instance, the Whitaker Block Party, et cetera, are required to follow certain laws. We get a fire marshal inspection. We have to have fireproof tarps, extinguishers, and booth weights in our booths. Um, they also required liability insurance. 
when Saturday Market had their booth on the corner there before the stabbing. Um, we were required to have over $3 million in liability insurance for the one booth and told repeatedly by the county no sales on the plaza. Um, we, both groups are also required to take their garbage and have garbage cans and dispose of the garbage and clean up after the event. Um, all the other ones are also required to pr provide bathrooms, security, etc. cetera. Uh, the group that sets up on the courthouse plaza pays no fees, has no liability insurance. The fire marshal never inspects. They aren't required to remove their garbage. And I would advise you to come by sometime about 8 o'clock on a Saturday night and see how much garbage is left behind to blow around all day Sunday. And if you come by Sunday night, you'll find the pile gets bigger. Um, I think this is really an inadequate application of the law that some people are required to follow city ordinances, state ordinances, health laws, and others aren't. Um, also, there's often things being sold over on this side, um, out in that plaza, that um, are part of the problem in our town. Drugs are openly sold, alcohol is openly sold, and it creates an, not only an unhealthy environment, but it brings a lot of criminals to our community. And I think for that this has to be addressed. And you guys have been ignoring it for years and it keeps snowballing and getting bigger and bigger every single year. Um, you can say maybe because they're poor people, but I can't afford a car. I see the SUVs and pickup trucks that pull up for them to load and unload their stuff. I can't even afford to get my bicycle fixed. Um, it, it's just grossly unfair, and I think you need to start applying the laws equally. Last up, last up is Spencer Nelson. Hello. Ooh. My name is Spencer Nelson, and I live in Eugene. I am here to talk about minimum wage and how it should not go up in price to help accommodate for America's laziness. I turned 16 March 24th, 2014. I got my first job in May 2014. I started working at a grocery store, cleaning toilets and getting shopping carts, making a minimum <coughs> wage, which is now 9.25 an hour. I turned 18 March 24th, 2016. <laughs> I will start as a checker next week and make more than minimum wage. Yes, I have made $9.25 per hour until now. But you have to work hard to play hard. I put in 40 hours a week over the past two summers saving money and making money. Where does that money go? Most of it to tack it taxes, but we are talking about the minimum wage. I work hard to play harder, so you need to put in work to get bank out of it. Minimum wage shouldn't be $15 an hour or $13.50 once it's going to go up here in the next six years, because honestly, that would just motivate me not to go to college, to stay cleaning court. Oh to stay cleaning toilets than touching your groceries after till I die. I'm going to close the public hearing. Thank everyone for coming. And um, just a couple comments that, um, to my knowledge, in the entire uh, South Willamette uh, process, I know of no, and no one who um, was dishonest or of ill intention. Um, and I also know of no backroom deals, so just want to make that clear. Uh, in, uh, in terms of the uh, conversation about, I think it's a worthy conversation to have about temporary workers, um, I do want to say that um, I have historically been a big fan of Solidarity Network. Happy to talk with them about issues anytime, but I think there's some misconceptions that they've brought forward tonight. 
And um, I did want to say to Sue that uh, it's not, I agree with her about the numbers of restrooms, but I also think that one problem that we might um, do better with if we had people who were uh, working those restrooms, the, the ones that are the uh, built-in ones, they get so much abuse, things get broken all the time. It had cost a lot to fix them back up again. And that's one of the reasons why they're closed and we're using uh, the porta potty. So we might be able to use some of the structures we have and keep them in good shape if we had a, were able to get a little bit more um, oversight in place. Anyone else have anything they want to add? Chris, I mean, Councilor Pryor. Thank you. Um, appreciate everybody coming out and uh, speaking this evening. Um, it's always uh, great to hear the diversity of perspectives. Um, curious about the, the City Hall um, conversation, um, not counting the um, demolition costs, you know, just looking at it now as an empty space. Um, have you signed or authorized any construction contracts for City Hall? Uh, no, we haven't. So how much of the proposed cost of City Hall has been expended to date? In construction, uh, in construction, nothing under the other than the demolition. Okay, so we've not signed any contracts, um, or approved contracts, or expended any money. That's correct. Um, so no money's been spent. At this okay. point, you've been collecting costs for us. What it's going to cost? To other than architectural fees and engineering fees. Yes, yeah. I mean to pay for finding out how much that would cost. Uh, true. Okay. Um, the decision to add the fourth floor, put in council offices, um, do or not do seismic upgrades, who made those decisions? Uh, the city council made those. You didn't make them? That's correct. Did you hold any secret meetings with developers, contractors, architects, or builders um, with the promise of money, favors, or benefits if you sent work their way? No. Um, so, it, so since no contracts have been signed, no decisions have been made, no plans have been approved, do you anticipate that we will be having any more meetings with regard to the plans for City Hall? Uh, what we talked about in your last meeting is um, you gave us direction to go out to bid with the current design. We'll go out for bid, get bid documents back, and then we'll come to council and then the council has a choice on whether to proceed or not. And then at that point can authorize the dollars to move forward. So you anticipate we will be having either work sessions or meetings to talk about um, further costs and, and plans and construction documents and things. So there'll be more meetings about City Hall. Yes. And we will be making decisions about those final things. So there will be meetings. Yes, the council is one, the only ones that can make the meeting or the decisions to move forward on the construction of the City Hall. Okay, so at this point, have you made any unilateral decisions about the city hall construction that were outside of direction from council? Uh, no. Thank you. Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to respond to uh, some of the people that are speaking against the Clark Brown Initiative for South of Willamette, Mr. Tadowski, Mr. Price, Ms. Smith, Ms. Weiner, Ms. Kaczynski, and Ms. Ortsman. Um, I think you are having a fundamental misunderstanding of how this process is going to work, the creation of the refinement plan. Um, you seem to think that your voices will not be heard. Your voices will be heard, uh, but initially it will be the community planning team. And then once council, which will be chosen by council, but the candidates will be chosen by the neighbors and they will be put forward. And council, this, this is how it's worked before uh, with Jefferson West Side neighbor, neighborhood. They have a wonderful refinement plan. Uh, respects the integrity of the older established neighborhood, but it allows for growth. Um, same could be said for Whitaker. So the, the process is, is, is known, and it's a, a very good one. And um, you can submit information to the community planning team anytime you want, and there will be public hearings. The council and, and the planning commission will hold public hearings. There's plenty of, of there'll be plenty of time for every anyone in the whole community that wants to weigh in on it. 
we'll be able to do that. The time not to do that, not to have a facilitated all comers meeting is at the beginning. I think that will be, I mean, I know it's a well-meaning attempt, but I'm, I'm certain that will fail because it, it puts the neighbors and the local, the local neighbors and the businessmen, the small businesses and property owners at a distinct disadvantage when you have uh, a huge number of people piling on. Um, um, so I, I think you have a, they're not quite understanding how this is going to work. It's going to be a really good process. And it's scaling it back to pretty much the original intent of, uh, of what became SWAS. The original intent was to, hey, I know, let's get together with the business people on Willamette and the, and the people that live there, and let's try to improve the pedestrian experience and the shopping experience. And then kind of like Topsy, it just kept growing and growing and growing into, you know, a pretty massive uh, rezoning proposal of uh, 250 homes, modest homes, by and large, affordable to working families that would have allowed them to be replaced by very expensive condominiums. So it actually would have worked against affordable housing in that neighborhood. And I, I think people need to keep in mind also, um, Ward 1 is already the most dense neighbor in, uh, ward in, in Eugene. There's 20,000 people in every ward. If you look at a map, you will see that it's, it's the smallest ward. I did want to say, since uh, it's been brought up, that, and I did send this to council, and some of you all have received this too, um, that I, um, um, and Council Brown is going to, in tonight's meeting, going to put forward a motion to withdraw the South Willamette it, Special Area Zone package, and, and I'm, I support that. I think that's very important. We need to provide certainty to neighbors as a step to establish a trust. We all need to move forward. And I talked to the city manager, told uh, uh, Councilor Clark and Councilor Brown we'd schedule a work session on their proposal that will happen on June 27th. And then uh, we'll have a forum on June 20th to allow um, councilors and the whole, as many people who want to participate in that to participate in that. And we'll have, uh, hopefully have a facilitator from the Oregon Solutions to help us through that. Um, that forum. So those are all scheduled in and um, and ready to go. Thanks, everybody. We're going to move. Yes, Councillor Evans. Um, Mayor, uh, uh, Councillor Taylor and I will not be available uh, in person on the 27th. We're going to be traveling to the National League of Cities meeting. So we may want to adjust that schedule a bit so that all of us can be here. We'll look at that. Just wanted to give you guys some certainty that was happening. Um, Councilor Clark. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to say a quick thank you to Councilor Pryor for his thorough questions of the manager with regard to the City Hall project. He's kind of elucidated with his questions, that which I have always maintained, that I believe the manager has consistently responded the majority of council with regard to the city hall project followed their direction and given us all the information that that the council majority has asked for and followed the direction that they've said we, and I, I have to say then in addition with due respect to my colleagues i think it's the majority of council that's off track on this project and not the manager so i will continue to advocate for what i think is the best idea but i do think it's a good idea for us to be clear that the manager is simply responding to the will of the majority of council. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on now. Mayor, can I just mention, Certainly. Councilor uh, Poling asked that you just check in with him because he was having a difficult time checking in. He could hear, so we just wanted to make sure he's, that you could check in with him to make sure he can talk into the room. So, George, can you hear us? Yes, I've been monitoring, and uh, okay. I tried earlier to get in, and obviously I wasn't being heard. Oh, sorry. Um, That's all he asked is to ensure he could be heard into the room. So. Oh, we'll, we'll work at that. And George is right next to you there, so he'll be, sure, he'll be sure you, if I don't catch it, he'll catch it. Would you like to uh, get in and say something? Uh, no, not this time. Right I, I would like to be on the queue for the uh, item number three, though. Okay. Three. The housing first. Resolution, which is coming up now. Yep. So, yes, go ahead and move. 
Surely. Okay. Um, I move to adopt resolution 5153 in support of the housing first strategy. Second. Moved and seconded. Councilor Fryer. Um, yeah, uh, I serve on the uh, Human Rights Commission, which is one of the groups that is forwarding this to you. And it's been um, reviewed by the city as well as by them on a number of occasions. <clears throat> and I think it's 99.9% it's .9 good. And, and I support it completely. I think it's, it's an important thing that we've actually asked for. Um, but there were a couple of, I think, relatively minor modifications that are really intended to just clarify what our intention is here. And, and I think Jennifer um, really pointed them out. Uh, the first one is in Section 1, we talk about the primary strategy to address the need for adequate low-cost housing, which was what we asked for. So that's what was brought to us. Um, I think not only the Human Rights Commission, but as you know, I also serve on the Housing Policy Board, where we work a lot on low-income housing. And this might also be a question that they would have, is Housing First intended to supersede the low-income housing effort that Housing Policy Board's working on? And I know it's not, but by just changing the word primary to core, that would completely clarify it and, and show that it's a, it's a core, but it's not the only, and I think that was the key element. And I think the same is true in the, in the Section 2 substitution where we talk about the current programs, um, and I think the, the, the point was the current programs are great, but they're this big. And so we wouldn't want to imply that this big is okay that if we can make this big bigger, we would also want to do that. And so I'm think, I think by adding, and future program expansions and innovations simply says, we're still supporting with housing first, but if you have the chance to make shelter options larger, this wouldn't preclude that from happening. So I would recommend that we just make those two, I think, relatively minor adjustments to this. Before I turn to Councilor Syrett, I guess um, I want to be careful when we do that that we talk about that we're building a system oh, yes. to um, try to um, either shelter or house homeless folks. We're doing both, yeah. But I don't want people to think that shelter is housing because it's not, it's not. housing. It's needed, necessary, and we, need to, and we need to include it in our system. But it is not the same thing as housing. That's an important point. Right. Councilor Syrett. Thank you. Um, I don't know if we need to make a formal motion to change that wording, but I would support that. And I want to thank those folks who came out tonight to speak to the Housing First Resolution and to remind us that emergency and temporary shelter needs to be part of the landscape of uh, how we help address the needs of our homeless folks. Um, and uh, so I think the housing first as a core strategy is very important and cost effective and humane and we also need to find some funding for our temporary shelter, our rest stops and other programs along those lines. Do you, do you have uh, changes in language? I have two motions if um, we can make them as one motion together or we can make them as two separate motions. I, I probably would make them as one motion. Okay. And this gets at what you just mentioned. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. That's exact. That's all it is. Is um, and I can go ahead and do it now. Or do you want to go ahead and hear um, from uh, George? Oh, George. Uh, um, Councilor Polling. George, can you hear us? Yes. You're up I'm, next. We're gonna. Did you hear about the yeah. the minor amendments? Yes, I did. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can yes, hear we you. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm okay with the the minor amendments, um, and I will support this resolution. And you know, it's something that that I said all along. The resolution recognizes that this is not an isolated Eugene issue, and we, the city of Eugene, can't take it on all by ourselves. And that's why I'm glad that we've got the Poverty and Homeless Board uh, of Lane County working on this. And also on the back in section three, um, you know, this is um, housing, approach, housing first approach requires a multi-governmental strategy that includes investing in new and existing housing units. The multi-governmental strategy is very important to me, as well as in section four, it says the city of Eugene is committed to working in partnership with other jurisdictions. I'm glad other jurisdictions are finally uh, acknowledging that this is not the city of Eugene's problem alone and that we can't do it. So I'm, I'm glad that this is coming forward. 
uh, you know, it's obviously it's it's recognized by HUD and it it uh, it's worked in other places. I just hope that we can make it work. <coughs> Thank you. I was just going to ask, so the resolution, the motion that's on the table is the one that was here, right? And so right. you need to change the language to say as amended? Well, I'm, I'll read I'm, a motion to move I'm, to amend. Okay. I, well, I will accept the... A friendly. The, the, friendly? The, the, yeah, the amendments as, as a friendly to my original motion if Councilor Taylor will second yes. that. So I'll, I'll read the two sentences as they're yeah. amended so you can see them. So it would be um, the second section of section one to read to that end, the city of Eugene is committed to a housing first approach as a core strategy to address the need for adequate low cost housing. And the second section of section two would read, the housing first approach is not intended to be a substitute for the current programs or future program expansion and innovations of the city that address those emergency shelter needs. Yep. Okay. Are you okay? Yep. All right. So I think we're ready to vote on that. All those in favor, please indicate. One, two, three, four, five here. Councilor Poling? How do you vote, George? I vote yes. Councilor Zelenka? Alan? Yes. Okay. And, it's, and Councilor Clark? Aye. So that's eight in favor and none in opposition, and it passes. Thank you all very much. The next item up is the motion to withdraw the South Willamette Special Area Zone. Councilor Brown, do you want to put that motion on the table? Yes, Mayor. I move to withdraw the entire South Willamette Special Area Zone adoption package, including but not limited to the creation of the South Willamette Special Area Zone. Second. Moved and seconded. I'll just speak to it briefly. Um, it's uh, pretty much acknowledging everybody, the manager, the mayor, and the council that, um, you know, gave it the best effort, but it just didn't work. And um, so th this will uh, set everybody's mind at ease and that it's going away. It's not going to come back and we're going to try a new thing. And um, so it's just kind of like a housekeeping thing, really. Thank you. Councilor Pryor? Yeah, I will, I will support this motion um, because I think it's important for us to recognize that um, a lot of the work was perhaps at some point may be able to be revisited, but that the way we did it was the issue here. Um, that's what I hear most often. It's, it, we just didn't do it the right way. And I think this is an opportunity for us to say, then let's just stop that and let's just try again. Maybe at some point we may look at some of the work that's done and said there may be some value here, but I think we need to do it in a completely different way, and I'm grateful for um, uh, Councillor Brown to uh, give us the opportunity to step back. Anybody else? Okay. All those in favor, please indicate. There's five here. Councillor Clark? Aye. Councillor Zelenka? Yes. And Councillor Polling. Yes. Okay, that's eight in favor and none in opposition. It passes. And with that, we are reset.